afternoon for those in Europe. Uh, welcome to the first of what we hope is a series of Field Fisher seminars. Um, bear with us as this is the first one. So hopefully you can now all see my screen, which has the slides on it. Mm -hmm. uh, today we're talking about primarily subject access requests. Um, something just beeped, so hold on. This looks like it's still coming through. Okay, fine. Um, primarily, we're talking about subject access requests. Um, we may get on to deletion requests as well or other rights requests, but we are, um, we imagine there's probably enough to talk about on subject access requests only today. And if there are um, any er other areas we go into, we'll try and cover them today. Otherwise, we're going to save them from another seminar. The idea the idea is that this is um, going to be the first of a number of webinars uh, every month and each time we'll go through a particular area of GDPR compliance and talk through it from a practitioner's point of view and give you case studies that we've been involved in, um, obviously anonymized, and hopefully have some useful guidance from that. The um, questions are uh, function is open, so uh, uh, we can't see any chat. So if you want to ask a question, and we have had some before the seminar sent in already, then um, open the questions tab on your um, control, and that will come to us here. So the, the idea, yeah, it, no one else will see it other than us. So do ask a question if you have one, and we're proposing to speak till about 8:30. California time and then have about 15 minutes for questions. So um, anything comes up throughout the presentation or any burning issues you have on this subject, then just send them in and we'll try and get to them as we go through. Um, so that being said, uh, now's the beginning of August. The next one will be for the beginning of September. Um, it, one, one question could be what you really want us to talk about next time. So bear that in mind as well. Um, you're all muted as attendees, so um, no one can hear you talk if you talk, but um, the way we can hear you is by sending a question, and it, it won't go to everyone else, it will only come to us. So feel free to send whatever you want. Uh, so that's all the logistics. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Alex. I'm initially from the UK office and now based out here in Silicon Valley. On the line as co-panelists, we have Gemma Chubb, who's recently joined Phil Fisher and has employment uh, as a background, and Anna Gasso, who's uh, French, but based out here in California as well. And uh, she joined the privacy team um, a bit, little more than a year ago. So those are the other voices you'll hear other than mine. And so without further ado, let's proceed. So, Gemma, over to you. So, over to me. Yes, I'm Gemma, and as Alex um, said, my background is primarily in um, English employment law, um, but I also do a lot of data privacy work as well. Now, under the GDPR, people in the EEA can ask for a copy of access of any personal data that a controller processes about them. Um, you'll probably all be already aware that personal information includes information which directly identifies an individual such as their name, their address, their email address and any other contact information but also less obvious identifiers such as cookies, um, an IP address and opinions about that individual. So when they make a subject access request they'll reasonably ex expect to have access to the data within emails, IMs, memos, minutes, notes, but also location information, um, and the definition would also include CCTV. You might receive DSARS, and apologies for my um, my abbreviation there, I hope everyone's comfortable with it, but rather than trying to spiel out data subject access requests over and over again, I'll refer to them as DSARS here. 
So you might receive them from customers, clients, suppliers, job applicants, members of your current workforce and workforce of any of your clients or customers as well, or really anyone who has any reason to believe that you may be processing their data. I have to say they're not new. People in Europe have had this right at least since 1998, well, in, in its very particular form. However, the GDPR has had a lot of press attention and there's increased awareness about this right. Therefore, a huge number of our clients here in Silicon Valley hadn't received a data subject access report before. And since the 25th of May, we're seeing them receiving one, if not multiple um, um, requests for the very um, first time. In this session, we're going to give you some high level and hopefully practical insight about how you might receive a DSA, what steps you might want to take and how you need to think about responding to it. We're also going to touch on what I think is, is quite often a very tricky subject of how you handle a DSA that comes from employees or other members of staff. And now over to Anna. Hi, this is Anna. Um, so as Alex mentioned, I am French, but I've been in the US for a while now and I've been with Phil Fisher with, um, for a year. Um, and so to continue, um, the GDPR, um, the right that are under the GDPR are listed in um, the Article 15 to 22. Uh, today we're going to focus on the subject access request, which is a request that comes and asks you to provide all the information that you have about an individual and um, a list of information uh, related to that data. But there is also the right to um, rectification, the right uh, to erasure, which is also called the right to be for, uh, forgotten. Um, there is the um, right to request a restriction of the processing, uh, the right to request data portability, the right to object to processing, and the right to withdraw uh, consent if um, the processing of the personal data um, was based on the individual's consent. Yeah, and um, we're, we're going to talk about DSARs primarily today, but um, just something to bear in mind that we've come across from our various clients is the key to all of these things is being able to isolate data. So pretty much all of these rights, if you can't find a particular individual's data, it's very hard to respond to one of these requests. Um, and that can prove quite difficult in practice to locate a particular end user's data. And as Gemma will probably come on to, um, particularly in the employment context, that is um, challenging. Yeah, it's particularly difficult because if you think, if, if I give you a rather crude example, um, like the data stored within a bank, all of the, that information will largely be kept in, in fields and in machine readable format that is very, very self-contained. Much of the data that you have for your employees will be completely mixed in different forms, different emails, and importantly, mixed with, with other members of staff as well. Sorry, Alex, for butting in there. No, that's why you're on the line. Um, <laughs> so um, the first uh, challenge you'll face is when to recognize you have um, got a DSAR. And the the law is not that helpful because it, it's very much on the side of the requester. And so it doesn't specify any particular format uh, that DSA has to be made because it's you know it's trying to give individuals um, make it easy for individuals to exercise their rights. So there are no kind of qualifications on how to um, submit a DSA. So as you see on the slide, it can be written or verbal, coming to absolutely anyone. It doesn't have to follow a prescribed form. So um, some organizations, if you ask for a subject access request, they'll say, okay, sure, fill in this form. As a requester, you do not have to do that. You can say, no, um, I just want all my data. I'm not filling in the form. It can come via any method. So if you have a social media um, page, it can come via Twitter or Facebook, um, which can make it difficult if you're as an organization, if you're trying to funnel such requests into a particular format, the requester 
you know, you can try and nudge them into that, but if they refuse, then they're perfectly entitled to do so. It doesn't have to say, um, I am exercising my rights under GDPR or under my local uh, data protection legislation. They don't have to specify that it's a subject access request. They can just say, I want a copy of all my data or I want to see what you're doing about my processing and so on. And all of these can be valid. There's no need to reference legislation or anything. So the key is it's anyone who in your organization who's likely to come across these things needs to be sufficiently aware to either um, initially deal with a request or pass it on to someone who is. So you may have a legal department that's um, trained for doing these dealing with DSARs, that's great, but you need um, people who are monitoring your social media feeds to recognize that actually we've got one. And it can be as simple as, I want all my data on Twitter. And so it, it potentially it's a very broad net that you may be covered with. Um, so th I think the key is just having awareness within your organization that um, these kind of things can't be ignored and particularly of people we've had some clients where they you know, because there's a time limit on these things and someone in um uh like it help desk or someone has been sitting on something for two weeks and they've even quoted legislation so someone said oh i want to exercise my rights under the data protection act 1998 for example in the uk and um no one's done anything about it um and then two days before the deadline, suddenly they're all in a panic. So the key is having awareness within your organization so that people know um, how and when to recognize these things. Um, and then just the, on the first point, it can be verbal, but it's a good idea to record such requests anyway. So if someone makes a request verbally, and that's often in the employment context, uh, it's a good idea to keep a note of it so that for time limit reasons, you know you can point to when the request was made. Um, so if there's nothing else, I'll move on to the next one. So we thought that the best way for you to uh, learn more about what, how to handle um, the data subject access request was going through a case study. So this is an example of what a nightmare looks like. Uh, but this is also something that you could receive. Um, so we thought that it would, we will give you a few minutes to read it uh, and then we can go over um, this case together. Yeah, and this is a blend of um, what we thought was horrible and what a client of ours actually got. So this is a um, realistic example of if you have a difficult uh, customer or end user, this is the kind of thing you, you may get in practice. So I'll give you a moment or two to read that. Now, this requester seems pretty clued up because they're using um, terminology that us practitioners may expect. Um, the average requester might just say, I want a copy of all my data, but here we have someone who's clearly knowledgeable in this area and is asking for very specific items. So how do we deal with this? So I think first we need to identify the different uh, requests that the individual is making in that um, case. So I think, of course, we have um, a request for a copy of all the personal data that the organization holds about him. This one is pretty easy to recognize. Um, and is listed in Article 15, so that's fine. Then there is a request regarding uh, some information uh, about the sources of uh, that personal data. So how um, did the organization obtain or collect the data and um, whether they shared it and with whom they shared that data. Um, so that's the first part. And then uh, what's interesting here also is that the individual is 
very precise about what he wants to see. And that's pretty much everything. So he wants to see factual information about him. So any information that you have about him, any correspondence. So that includes emails, that includes chats, um, anything that you can think of. Um, and then any notes or inferred information that you have recorded about him. So that's the first part, of, I mean, the second part. And then there is also um, probably the most interesting piece in this um, request is that the individual is requesting you or the organization to detail the legitimate interest assessment, which is if you've been relying on your legitimate interest to process uh, his or her personal information, uh, you might, uh, or you not might, but you should have um, done a, a balancing test or an assessment between um, your legitimate interest and that individual uh, rights, uh, fundamental uh, rights and, and freedoms and interests. Uh, and you're not uh, specifically required to have and to um, disclose that information in your privacy policy, um, but, and there is nothing in Article 15 that requires you to um, also disclose that information, but uh, you might uh, want to do that just because that's what the regulators and in particular the Article 29 Working Party uh, wants you to disclose uh, if you get a request from um, an individual. Um, so that's something that we'll discuss in more details after, but um, there is also something that is not um, part of the Article 15 request, but this is also something that an individual may request that um, is um, telling you that he wants to withdraw all the consent, uh, I mean, that is withdrawing um, his consent if you're relying uh, on his consent to process um, his data or her data and, is, um, and even asking you whether you are actually um, relying on consent. Um, and then is uh, asking you not to process, to stop processing all of the information and to uh, stop allowing third party to do so. And it's also um, objecting to uh, your right to use his personal or her personal information for marketing purposes. So, so I'll, I'll chip in there, Alex, is that all right? And um, we'll, I think we will go back and forth to this case study, but I thought as a, it would be really um, helpful I think to just to cover a few kind of practical things about what you do when you initially get this request because it's quite easy just to see it panic and to kind of go down a rabbit hole of trying to accumulate masses of information or even to take a, a different stance and to, to take quite a defensive position and think that you're not going to give anything at all. Um, but as a first thing, what you need to do is, is log the date on which you receive mm -hmm. this, this request. Um, now, everyone has heard that you that you have one month to respond to a DSAR, and that that period can be extended um, by two months if that request is complex. Now, I think it's really important that we, we actually look at the exact wording of Article 12.3 here. It says that the controller shall provide information on action taken on the request without undue delay, undue delay and, with, and in any event within one month of receipt. And that period may be extended by a further two months where necessary. It does not say that you have to provide the documents within one month, although I, I strongly suspect that that is the spirit and intentment of that clause. It says we have to provide information of what we've done. So in my view, this anticipates real and, and this and bear and don't forget my slant here as a kind of a litigator and an employment practitioner. But this anticipates, in my view, a dialogue between controllers and a subject. And that dialogue may give a data controller some more control and flexibility over timing. What specifically what I'm thinking here is that you will need to be thinking about sending an initial response to um, a data subject, um, either asking for more information, which I'll come on to in a moment, um, but also, if, if possible, telling them what you've done so far. That might have been an initial search and you can give information about the number of search results yielded so far and explaining that you need some more help to locate their data. So a second key bit of information that you need to ask for them or, or to think about whether you need to ask for them is whether whether you whether you need anything else in order to be able to identify them. 
Article 12.6 says that where a controller has reasonable doubt about the identity of a data subject, they may ask for more information in order to, con to confirm that identity. If we're talking about an employee, a current employee, a candidate or an ex-employee, this might be less relevant because you, you may receive that data subject access request, for instance, from their work email account. But consider the situation where we're talking about an employee sending it from a personal email account. Even in that case, or an ex-employee, even in that case, you need to think quite carefully about whether you trust the source of that information in this day and age. Do you need any other information to show that the person requesting is definitely the subject? But you, so you're saying as a general rule, if it's an employee of yours who's made a data subject access request, it's you don't need to ask for their passport or a social security number or equivalent because you know who they are. So it, it can be a simpler verification method. Absolutely. But I think the thing you need to be careful of is, is, is kind of you need to look at the, each situation in case. If it's coming from a work email address, you have no reason to ask for any further identification. Mm. If it's coming from a personal email address, do you have that personal email address on record? If not, do you have it, you know, it, it might be obvious that it's coming from an individual because there's been a string of email correspondence, particularly in relation to a dispute. So, you know, it's them. But you just need to be careful um, here about kind of the common things like hacking and in, um, data, um, data theft and things like that. Uh, and, and the GDPR anticipates that you might need to take this sort of precaution. What about requests from clients, users, suppliers or other people that you haven't met before? Historically, as Alex just said, um, controllers would ask for a copy of the data subject's passport or driving license to confirm their, this ident their identity. That might be cumbersome if you're dealing with multiple requests. And, you know, honestly, we've had some clients who have received um, request numbering in the hundreds since the 25th of May. Another um, way to manage this, this um, verification process might be to send a verification link to the data subject's email address, which they then have to click on, and that verifies their identity. That might work, but it's not foolproof. Um, it would work, for instance, if all the data that you contain about that individual is linked to that particular email address. If not, you might need to think about whether you actually need a copy of some um, other proof um, just in case. There's no hard and fast rules on this. Have also on that subject, have a careful think about the information that you have that you have, um, and that will also guide the level of verification that you need to do. Um, again, if, if it's linked to an email address and it's all kind of generic um, kind of access data, then then that's one thing. If you're holding vast swathes of sensitive data, then it would be completely reasonable for you to be taking extra precautions. Similarly, if you're in a dispute and a request comes via solicitor, lawyer or other representative, you, you need to think about seeing evidence of that solicitor's or representative's authority to make the request on the subject's behalf. Um, and also um, link to that any evidence of the right to receive the information on the subject's behalf. Moving off that, have a look at what they're actually asking for. And if we look back at this, um, um, this um, case study, what are they actually asking for? A copy of all the personal data that you hold about me. Now, that's all very well, but do we need any inf further information to help them find that, that, that data? Although one may try, we can't make a data subject reduce the scope of a request, but we can definitely ask for more information to help us locate the data. If you're talking to an employee, this might be um, information about a particular time or an event. I'll come on to that in more, um, in, in more detail later on. But if the request has been made by a user, we might need um, something like you know, their, their, um, their, their IP address or analytics ID. Yeah, and so, uh, just to cut in there, it, it's worth remembering that virtually no requests are made just because someone is um, curious about what you're doing with their data. It's pretty much always going to be a disgruntled employee or um, part of a litigation pre-disclosure exercise to put pressure on you or might be an investigative journalist, but it, it's perhaps under GDPR it'll be curious people, but typically 
there's someone with an agenda so that they're, they're often looking for something if it's a disgruntled employee they're certain there's a there's a smoking gun somewhere so they're looking for a specific email in which you know they think a conversation happened so it can help to say okay well you, you've asked for all your data forever that's going to take us you know three months to find um do you mind you know specifying exactly what you're looking for or if you're aware it was in this year can you like can we just give you that the the requester is under no obligation to limit their request but it can definitely help and it's actually encouraged by the ICO the UK regulator to engage in some sort of dialogue with the requester um, both to show them that you're actively working on the request um, to improve relations and also to limit the, the amount of administrative time to deal with your request as well. So it's really important that you think about these sorts of questions early on and hopefully I mean, I don't know whether it's hopeful or not, but it, it's likely that that most of the people listening to this will be getting data subject access requests. And if you haven't already, that you will do in the future. Um, what we would like to see is that people um, develop their own internal processes to help them um, deal with these requests so that you know exactly the questions that you need to ask. Some of them might be um, kind of um, standardized questions where you've operationalized the process. Other times you may need to, to, to treat things um, in specific, in a specific and customized manner. But it's important to, front, to, to do this early on um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, you need to be able to use the time that you have efficiently. Um, you need to be able to, um, to avoid the risk of complaints to a regulator. And in the event that a data subject does make a complaint, which is very common, you need to be able to show a regulator that you're cooperating and not being obstructive. On that note, I think it's very helpful to keep in mind when you're liaising and, and communicating with the data subject access, access um, sorry, the data subject about their access request, um, to imagine that your audience is actually the regulator. And if you do that, it'll help you to be able to, um, it will guide the tone of your correspondence um, potentially from um, combative to a more constructive tone, which will, which is what the regulator wants to be able to see. And I think that's really true, especially in the context of asking them to confirm the identity, because we've seen some clients uh, or some other organizers, organization being very strict about the fact that they want to have it or to see a copy of an ID. And um, you just have to keep in mind that if you can find another way to verify that person's identity, then you should not insist on seeing a copy of the ID just because if a regulator were to look at that, they will probably think or they might think that you're actually trying to prevent the individual from exercising their rights. So with those preliminary um, thoughts out of the way, you'll then move on to actually dealing with the request itself. You'll need to think about how you're going to conduct a search for the data using what, what have become hopefully agreed search terms. And hopefully you would have agreed those with the data subject during the course um, of your early correspondence. That is, of course, unless um, you are the type of business where actually the, the, the information is readily available at the click of the button. And that's that's much more straightforward. Once you've retrieve the data, you're going to need to check it um, and if necessary, redact it to remove third party data and exempted data. More, more on those later. And lastly, then you, you actually take steps to respond. And the information, it's not going to be just a case of handing over the data. You, Article 15 um, sets out a list of information that you have to be able to provide um, to the data subject. Um, we're going to look more at that in a moment. But before we do that, I wanted to, to look um, very quickly about how you actually provide the data. Now, the GDPR says that they have a right of access to the data itself, not the document. Therefore, um, you might find yourself in the position of handing over heavily redacted documents um, um, depending on the amount of data you actually process, this may be a quite a, a time consuming and, and potentially inflammatory exercise. Imagine going back to litigation again, 
you are in a contentious situation and you find yourself um, handing over three, four, five files of heavily, heavily redacted information, that, um, if I was on the receiving end of that, that would probably fire me up. An, an alternative way of dealing with this is whether you would, um, you could extract the data within each document and put it into a, into a table. What I'm thinking about here is that you'd have a first column that talks about, um, that has a, a broad date range, you know, you might do it by months of the year, the second column that de describes the document um, or the type of document, so email, memo, instant messenger, access data, whatever it is. And the third column, which actually in, into which you lift the data um, that you've retrieved. Um, that might seem time consuming, but if you weigh it against the, the time that it takes to, to redact documents, um, I think you'll find it's, it's um, much of a muchness. Yeah, and again, bear in mind, if your requester is a um, an activist or someone who has... Sorry, uh, if, if you're a... Bear in mind your requester here. So um, we've had a couple of examples where the requester is particularly active on social media. And so our client knew whatever they sent was going to be posted um, to the world at large. And that reflects that was reflected in what we ended up redacting. Um, so they're not entitled to the document itself, but they're entitled to all their personal data. So that might end up being just an email with sufficient context to understand. So a, a date stamp sent from um, R2, and then all the other information removed other than the information about the requester. Um, but it, take a common sense approach so if someone if you know the request has received an email there's no point redacting it because they have that already so you end up looking stupid if you were you know get rid of all the information but there's a balance if other people's information is um, included okay so uh, I'll go back to the extra information that um, I'm not sure how much of this is on the directive, but certainly in GDPR, it spells out that you're supposed to provide all this other stuff as well as the actual data itself. Um, so what do we think about this? Should we spell all this stuff out or is it sufficient to just provide the data and hope that that answers all these questions? So my view would be it very much depends um, on the um, the kind of the detail, the level of detail in your privacy notice. To take a step back again, this is all information that should be in your privacy notice. So, to my mind, the question is: Do you want to? Should you be replicating that information and customizing it per data subject, or is your privacy notice good enough that you can quite simply? refer straight back to it and said all of the article 15 information that I'm required to provide to you is already in our privacy notice please see that hmm. um, that, that would mean that your privacy policy would be very specific and yes. in many cases um, the privacy policy that we read are not very really specific and they use the words or expression like may or might uh, or from time to time and that might be an issue um, in that I case agree. I agree. The, the 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 process that I or the kind of the, the position that I tend to adopt is um, to do somewhere that is um, a mix between the two. So we um, I would give information about the categories of personal data that I have about an employee, but in doing so, do it in a very pithy way and then refer back to the workplace privacy notice if there is one in place. Um, similarly for all the other um, um, categories of information there. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of a judgment call. Um, depends how who the requester is, what you think they're after, and how detailed your notice is. You might be able to say, please see this link, but if it's someone you know who has an issue, who's likely to make a complaint, the regulators probably won't look at that too favorably. Um, so Gemma, back to you. What about an employee? So yes, I've, I've touched on a lot of this um, already, and and I'll say you know it it, it applies to employees, it pl applies to ex employees, um, candidates. Um, it would could also um, apply where um, you are in a dispute with a customer. Um, I um, typically 
um, well, quite often advise law firms. And um, many of the law firms that I've worked for have actually received data subject access requests um, mm -hmm. from clients or people on the other side from clients. So it's it's it very these these tips and these issues can arise in a multitude of situations, but most commonly in relation um, to employees. Um, so one of the most important things is to have an awareness of the context and the motivation. Now, you can't withhold disclosure because of motivation and the ICO in the UK, the regulator in the UK, has been very clear in the past that data subjects have a right to make a subject access request. And they've said that that right is entirely separate to any other right they may have. Um, put, put slightly differently, even though an employee may be considering litigation, and even though they may deliberately be fishing for information prior to the normal disclosure, they still have a right to access that data. That, that said, it, it is important to keep the context in mind, even if it's only so that you are able to make an assessment of risk um, of any litigation or, more importantly, successful litigation. Um, on the subject of disclosure, there is obviously a potential overlap with litigation disclosure. If you end up in litigation, you will not have the same ability to redact documents in the same way as when you're dealing with a subject access request. Therefore, if disclosure is underway because a subject has submitted the request during litigation, it would be worthwhile just thinking about whether you actually just hand over the information unredacted. Um, the last three points on this slide, and just to deal with them very quickly because I'm conscious of the time, um, are, are all dealing with um, how you deal with the potential volume of documents. It wouldn't be unusual for an employee's documents to appear on in excess of 30,000 separate emails in just six months. That's just emails. Then there'll be calendar invites, instant messages, building access data, time recording data, CCTV and everything else. It's vital that you find a way to reduce the information in order to be able to locate exactly what they're expecting to see. So a few tips that I've kind of used over the years. Is there another dispute? For instance, is there a disciplinary action taking place? If yes, refer to that. There is no problem referring to that in your initial correspondence and asking the employee or the data subject whether it's fair to assume that the search should focus on the data processed around the time of that dispute. Another idea would be to consider excluding, excluding any data that the subject has already seen. So, um, for instance, emails that they've sent or received, um, you can say in your early correspondent that you're planning to do that. And I think it's an entirely reasonable approach. This alone would remove huge swathes of data. Hosted discovery platforms can save a lot of time and effort and they can make linked tasks a lot easier. For instance, if you have someone junior doing the first review and they want to check certain um, difficult um, calls with someone else, um, those platforms can facilitate that. Those platforms yeah. can also um, help you remove duplicates of documents. Sorry, Alex. Um, yeah, the, there are some service providers out there, um, but they, in, in our, my experience, they are, they're set up for litigation discovery and not really subject access requests. So this software isn't quite tuned to this, but it certainly helps a lot of the grunt work. I mean, we had one where it was tens of thousands of emails and using e-discovery software, um, we were able to deal with it in half the time. Um, so there are service providers out there, but I haven't come across one which is specifically tuned for these at the moment, but I'm pretty sure there's a gap in the market, so there will be one. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Gemma. Um, let's touch briefly on exemptions. You don't have to respond in full to all the requests, do you? No, that's right. Um, and this is the bit that typically takes a huge amount of time. So the GDPR says itself that you don't have to disclose data where it would adver adversely affect the rights and freedoms of others. The recitals um, say that that includes IP and, and, and copyright protecting software. Now, IP and trade secrets rarely contain any personal data anyway, but it's, it might be helpful in certain circumstances. It's much more complex where um, where the data subjects data is mixed in with third party data. 
Um, I can give you an example. Um, person A sends an email to person B giving an opinion about the data subject. Obviously, you've got persons, person A's data in their email address and also their opinion. You've got person B's um, data in, in their email address and you've got the data subject's data because that opinion is about them. It might be possible to redact that information so, so you can't see who person A and person B are, but it might still be clear who they are in any given context. If it's not possible to redact, then um, you don't have to hand over the information. That is unless the third party consents to the data being disclosed or it's reasonable to disclose without their consent. Now, the factors of what makes up a reasonable um, decision to disclose without consent would make up the subject of another um, um, webinar, so I won't go into it now, but bear that in mind. Yeah, and actually, an example from our practice, we had a request and it was... Uh, the issue was to do with a um, a, a birth uh, having gone wrong uh, in a medical context and so the requester was the husband and a lot of the data involved uh, the wife and child but the wife refused to give consent so the redaction was quite tricky because obviously if we're talking about patient x going in to give birth to patient y uh, well the requester knows exactly who patient X and Y are because he was there in the room um, and, and yet uh, you know patient X refused to give their consent so it's a it's a careful balance because you can't just it, you know it, it it depends on context as well because you know personal data the definition is very broad so if someone's identifiable you know if it was the only person in that situation then you know exactly who they are so you don't have you can't just replace them with a sort of identifier and expect it to um, fulfill that so it, it is a bit of a, a balance you can ask for their permission if they refuse it then you you essentially can't disclose data belonging to them um the last thing um, that i want to cover very briefly again um is is to say that the, there are other exemptions and they vary from country to country um, some of the ones which are most relevant in the uk and which are um, either replicated to a greater or lesser extent in other European jurisdictions are um, data which is covered by legal professional privilege. So that would include legal advice privilege and also litigation privilege. You don't have to give that information. Um, um, references which were given or received in confidence. Um, personal data which relates to management forecasting or planning, but only to the extent that the disclosure would prejudice the business, business activity. I'll give you an example there. Is, um, imagine an employee makes um, a data subject access request just before um, you um, kick off a restructuring or redundancy exercise. Um, if you handed over their data, that would most probably um, risk prejudicing that restructuring exercise. And so that exemption is designed to, to help in that situation. You also don't have to give um, information which consists of a record of an employer's intention in respect of settlement discussions which have taken place or which are taking place already. There are also some other exemptions, for example, um, relating to crime and taxation, but they do tend to be less relevant in your average employment related DSAR. Um, great stuff. Um... We cover redactions. We can't cover kind of that. Um, we just, I'm aware that we're, I've only set this up for 45 minutes, so the software may cut us out. Um, if so, apologies. Um, but we, we've had a number of questions in uh, by email, but perhaps we, we won't get a chance to go through them all. But um, we have one here about the time uh, time limit one has so uh, kind of double question so what does one month mean and then does the time stop um, whilst you're verifying request uh, so Anna or Gemma you have any thoughts on that 
Um, yes, one month means um, one month. So, um, you know, the you would have in, in the case of if you receive something on the 15th of July, you would have until the, the 14th um, of August to provide your, your information about the action taken. Um, the GDPR does not say anything in relation to whether time stops in, in, in order to deal with your verification process. Um, however, um, the ICO has recently issued um, some very um, subtle guidance. It was hidden hidden in there that said that, yes, it does. If you need to verify anything, then your time starts when you receive um, the, the, the verification information. So that's really helpful. And it, it, it just replicates the position um, that we have always had in the UK um, under the, the Data Protection Act 1998. The position may be different in other jurisdictions, so you, you would have to take a jurisdiction by jurisdiction approach. Yeah, but that makes sense to me. That's how we've kind of always viewed them. Um, but you can't wait 29. It's bad practice to wait 29 days, do nothing and then suddenly say, oh, can we verify your ID and we'll start from when we get that. Um, the, the earlier, the better. And even the GDPR builds in a, a time delay for particularly complex requests. The key is as long as you respond to the, the um, example I gave earlier was a very complex request involving the patients. Um, there was no way we we're going to respond within the month, but we just kept the data subject informed and we told them, right, you've there's seven years worth of data here. We're going through it all. We're not going to get you the full response by this date, but um, we can give you this now and we're still working on the rest. And actually, um, regulators encourage that kind of dialogue so you keep good relations um, they can you know you can see you're making efforts and um, tend to have fewer complaints following okay so let's see um, one final question before we get cut off um, oh so can a organization <laughs> rely on the fact that basically they're badly organized and the request is going to be very difficult to deal with can you just say look it's going to take us too long to find this stuff uh sorry <laughs> what do you think yeah, that Anna? would be great uh, that would be great um i would love that uh, no no to be uh, more seriously no you cannot that's your responsibility to be organized and to know exactly what data you collect what data you process where it goes and with whom you share that so that's also one of the requirements under the GDPR is to be a little bit more responsible about what you do with the data. So you cannot just say, well, we're not organized or we don't have the means to identify or no, we don't have the means to provide you with all the data because we don't have enough employees or whatever reason. I don't think that would work, at least not in brands. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it's a fast track to a more detailed investigation by a regulator um, mm -hmm. because you know if actually they see documents where you say oh, I'm sorry I can't find any of your data that would encourage them to look at you as a particular problem that may need their attention um, I was actually looking at this for a client just yesterday um, and, and it specifically relates to um, you have this ability to um, not to deal with data subject access requests under the GDPR if um, the request is man manifestly unfounded or excessive. Um, and and it says um, in particular because of the rep um, repetitive character. So I spent some time thinking about um, how useful that is and and the fact is there isn't any guidance yet from the regulator about what that means but i think the thing that is key is it's the request that is ma is manifestly excessive um not the the search results or the task in hand that is manifestly excessive um and that's really important to remember um because i think that that um well, we all think that that, that um, exemption, that ability not to respond is going to be very, very narrowly construed. Yeah. Um, and for those who follow the Field Fisher Privacy, Security and Information blog, 
world famous and uh, <laughs> excellent analysis. Um, not to blow my own trumpet, but I actually covered this point in a, an earlier post from the UK perspective. So if for more detail, look at that. Uh, unfortunately, we won't get to the other questions, but we can try and deal with them via email. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're about to be cut off here, so let's end it there. Um, you see our details on the final screen. So thank you to everyone for attending. And the idea is these are gonna be a series of um, regular webinars. Um, we're aiming for monthly, so next one is uh, likely to be in the first week of September. Um, subject to be decided, but there's a lot to talk about in this area, so we may go on to another um, data subject right. Uh, deletion is a big one for a lot of our clients here. Mm -hmm. um, so you have our details and feel free to suggest topics or any questions you'd like to be covered in the next one. And thank you all for attending. And I think if I click X here, you're all gonna disappear. So um, we'll see you all or hear from you all soon. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.